My name is Anthony Scardipane. I am a senior software engineer at Cisco. Woo! Shout out to Cisco, yeah. Uh, today we're going to be talking about change detection, right? The title of the talk is called The Magic and Mystery of Angular Change Detection. So I'd like to start off by first kind of just defining what change detection means overall, at least to me, right? And so really the job of change detection is to make sure our model, our data model, is in sync with our UI, right? And so it's a sequence of steps that Angular performs to make sure that that holds true. And we need to make sure that holds true because otherwise stuff happens that we don't want, right? We see stuff in the browser that's not reflective of our data model. So why is it important for you to know and learn about change detection? So this is sort of my promise to the audience, like why should you care to listen right now? Um, basically, I think it's important to deeply understand the code that you write. Um, it's kind of like the mechanic being able to open the hood of the car and, and fix something on the way right uh, to wherever they're going. When you deeply understand the code that you're writing, it's, you're a more efficient developer, you're going to be probably writing less bugs, right? You're actually understanding the tools that you're using, right? I've used on push change detection in the past and have no idea what the implications were, but I just heard it was cool and better. And so, I think when you do understand these things, it just makes you a better developer. I believe it will also enhance your collaboration with peers, right? Not just peers at the workplace, but peers in the community. Uh, Angular's been releasing like a lot of awesome RFCs and all these new features, and they're like actually requesting the community to collaborate and comment. And having, these con like having this context of change detection and understanding the workings of it, while you might not need it in your day-to-day -day life programming, right, because it, Angular's really good at making sure it works well, it's nice to be able to be in those conversations. And because of that, I think it also increases your marketability as an engineer overall, right? Like for your career, a lot of us are paid to be Angular developers, and I believe learning the inner workings of the framework and just getting more efficient using it, it's just gonna make you more marketable. Maybe you're gonna have a, like a job interview where they're gonna bring up change detection. All of my Angular interviews had uh, change detection questions, so I do think it's a good concept to learn. Anyway, let's start off with a very simple example. Right? We have a web browser here with an image and a button. And the image, as you can see, is blurred. And what happens when we click the button, the image becomes not blurry anymore. Right? So this is a change detection in process. This is Angular going ahead and, ch and checking the image uh, or replacing that view with the non-blurry image. So how is this working? Um, basically, we have this stripped down version Good, you could see it. Uh, the component, right, we have a small uh, portion of the template, and we could see we have an image element and we have a button element. And I, I put a little box around the show image class, and this is a property binding on the image, right? And then that's bound to a component property is clicked, which is a Boolean, right? And so this is important because this is what Angular is going to check when it's running the change detection process and the thing that it's going to be updating to refresh the view. So let's see what happens when Angular takes our component and compiles it, right? So Angular doesn't generally use our uh, component directly as we're writing it. Angular is going to compile our component code into what I like to like, say is like instructions for Angular uh, to run these, the process. And the two processes during this change detection process and also for the bootstrapping is the uh, create condition or create mode and update mode. And so this function, this magic hat component template, uh, you could see there's two conditions here. There's a first if condition up top, right? And this if condition is what's going to happen when the component is created for the first time. And so a lot of people were probably like, uh, I've never seen code like this. This is, like I said, again, compiled code that Angular has taken our component and transferred it into this uh, function. And this is what it's using to actually go ahead and create our DOM elements. So you might, you see stuff like ng element start, div, element, image, but in these, this is literally the, the example that I just showed you in a compiled version, and this is what Angular understands. They're taking this first condition, so when the app is created, when it's bootstrapped, or any time a component is, needs to be rendered, right? Maybe you route to a new page and there's new components that need to be loaded. It's gonna be running this create mode uh, condition of this function. And then the second 
is this uh, condition down here, and this is like the update mode. This is the same function that's run during the change detection process, but this second condition is run during every change detection process to, make, to compare those bindings, right? We, like the, the, the example I gave earlier had that class property binding uh, bound to the component property, and that's what it's going to be diffing. It's going to say, hey, is this value different? And if it is, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I have to do to update that view. Right? And the, the update uh, condition here is not re-rendering our component. Right? The, the, the rendering already has happened in the create portion. And this bottom part is just checking those bindings and updating the DOM as needed. OK, so this is kind of an overview again. Right? We have detect changes. This is just within the context of the, of the change detection process that Angular does. And so detect changes is called. This is simplified, but detect changes is called. And then it executes that magic hat component template. OK. So again, the two things I'd like to just go over is that we have the create mode and we have update mode. Create mode runs during bootstrapping uh, and any time a new component is created. It's instructions for like, literally laying out that, that DOM with our component, the code that we understand and we write, it takes it and it lays it out. The update mode is what's going to happen during every change detection process. It's instructions for updating those bindings, updating the view, and it's going to do those shallow diffs. So this, the four steps here I kind of also laid out. Right, We have the trigger, it, it triggers detect changes, it calls that update function, it updates the bindings if needed within the view, and then it repeats. And the repeat part is because as we, uh, we might not know, but basically Angular is going to always start at the root of our application, starting at that app component, and it's going to traverse down the entire component tree, but down every single component in our application. It could be tens, it could be hundreds, thousands of components, right? And that's how change detection works today. So a recap, change detection, the process within that Angular is responsible for it is responsible for updating the DOM. It does those diff checks, and it traverses the component tree top down. Now, how do we know when to run change detection? How does Angular know when to do it, right? Like, we know, that we know Angular's role now and what it's doing during that process per, per component, but we need to be able to trigger that somehow, OK? And so what happens, uh, this is a little metaphor that I've created that made sense to me. Hopefully, someone will uh, agree. But we have these five mailboxes on this empty road. And our job, right, we're going to pretend we're like the mail person to go and fetch mail and packages or whatever else might be in these mailboxes. Now, that's all we've been told. And so we're like, OK, well, maybe we should just go every hour or a few times a day and just check if there's anything in these mailboxes. And I just have to bring it back to the post office. But it's not the most efficient, right? Like someone might drop something off at 9 a.m. and we don't check it till 12. And those few hours that passed, like we could have gotten that mail earlier. So we have a good idea, and we think, well, maybe we should put like a sensor or like a camera across the street. In this case, floating in the air above the mailboxes. <laughs> and this sensor uh, is going to just—we're going to name it Zone JS. Uh, and you might see where I'm going. So the Zone.js is going to observe our mailboxes. And any time something happens that could potentially deliver something into the mailboxes, it's going to send us a notification. Right? A lot of us might have like doorbell cameras or like sensors around the house that say, like, oh, something occurred. But usually, we want it to do like when someone rings the doorbell or actually delivers a package. But as we know, sometimes it just triggers anyway, like a shadow passes by, and it sends us notification. Um, it's kind of going to be similar to this, right? We might want to know, hey, when a truck drives by, it could, it could contain a human ready to deliver mail. So we want to know when that happens, send me a notification. When a person that looks like they're carrying bags and mail, yeah, also send us a notification. If an evil squirrel appears out of flames, um, we would probably want to know that either way. But also, a squirrel could drop an acorn into the mailbox Right? So we're not just talking about mail here. We're talking about acorns and mail and packages. Um, and basically, what Zone.js's job is is just to send us that notification to go ahead and check the mailboxes. Now, bringing it kind of back to like Angular world, right? We might be able to think like the truck could be click events, right? The the person holding the mail could be input events. The squirrel could be like our HTTP requests. These are all things that Zone is going to look out for, among many others, 
to say, to tell Angular when something happened that could have potentially changed the view. And in our metaphor, potentially delivered mail. They might not have delivered mail. It could have just been a truck that drove by, just as not every event in, uh, that the Zone.js is observing could have impacted the view. But it's going to send the notification anyway. It's going to tell Angular to check stuff anyway. OK, so again, right, Zone.js is observing our application. And it's doing that by basically wrapping all of the browser APIs. Um, so the Zone.js recap is it's patching all of our browser APIs. We went over a few, right, like click, input, HTTP requests. But there's a ton that it's, uh, that it's patching. And any time those happen, Angular, um, Zone.js is telling Angular, hey, we don't know where or what happened, but go ahead and uh, like check all of your components just as the mail person goes and checks every mailbox every time. OK, um, so again, I think this helps also with the mental model of change detection, right? Like we're, when Angular is doing that traversal of the, of the tree of the data model, it's doing it uh, on the component, the data model tree side here. We also have a very similar tree, which is like our DOM tree. And if you like inspect your browser, you would probably see these elements like laid out you know, in your console. And you say, OK, this makes sense. These are all like a hierarchy of our DOM nodes. And Angular's not traversing that, right? It's very expensive to like, directly interact with the DOM. But what it's, what it's doing during change detection is it's traversing its, its data model tree on, on the Angular side, the component tree that we build. And then when it finds something that has changed, then it finds the relation within the DOM tree, and it updates that. So let's go over some examples here. We're going to start with um, a, the default I call these zone default components, and not me, I don't call them that. They, they started calling that an RFC. But the, the default components, these are like our, our regular Angular components, right? Like if you were to create an Angular uh, application today, these are the unchanged components, right? And so what happens when a button is clicked in one of these child elements or child components? We could see that zone.js is listening, right? Zone.js says, hey, an event occurred. Let's wait for the microtask queue to be empty, and then let's go tell Angular to go run change detection. And now Angular is like, OK, now I'm going to do my job, my change detection process, and I'm going to start at the root node, and I'm going to go down and traverse the whole component tree. And then eventually, hopefully, I find, oh, it looks like that component had a different uh, data binding. Then I'm going to go ahead and update that. Now, we might have heard of something called on push components. Again, I'm calling these zone on push components, but these are just the the using on push change detection strategy within your components as we are today. And we could see we add this annotation to the components, and this is an, an efficiency in our change detection pr process because now Angular is only going to check these components. It's going to only run that process we talked about earlier if this component's raising its flag. Bringing it back to the metaphor of mailboxes, some people might have mailed a letter recently, and you can raise a little red flag on the mailboxes to, to tell the mail person, like, hey, there's something in here you have to take. Right? And so while Zone.js is saying, go run this thing, when you, when you get to the mailboxes, you say, oh, I only have to open the ones that have the red flag. It's very similar within Angular. Right? It's, you're going you're to mark these components as dirty when they're using that on-push strategy. And Angular is only going to, to run that diff and run those update functions if its, if it's flag is raised. So let's go over the same examples before, but with the on push components, right? And I would like to clarify, like all of these are now on push components. These are, there's no more default components here, and this just kind of makes the example more easy to follow. Uh, so we're going to click the button in that child node. We're going to first mark the child component as, as dirty, right? So we raise the flag of the component that we know potentially has changes. Now, this could be manually by running change detection or implicitly, right? If you're using like an async pipe and uh, the observable returns a new object, it's going gonna, it's gonna to implicitly mark it for check. Um, so, but Angular starts at the, at the top node, right? It's always starting at the root node. So we need to figure out how to tell Angular this path to follow to find the child uh, component to update. So what it's going to do is go up the tree and mark all of its uh, parents also with those flags, right? And so, since these are all on push components, Angular will know, oh, well, I only have to check these four in this, in this case. And that's exactly what's going to happen, right? Zone.js is going to run. The event's going to uh, occur. We're waiting for the microtask queue to be empty. 
it's going to say Angular do your thing, and this time it only traverses those four components. So we could see a big improvement in efficiency here, right? We removed an entire uh, like section of the tree to, to check. This is great. Um, now, we have been hearing a lot about signals, right? And like all this reactivity model changing, and like we're, we're hearing stuff about change detection and potentially zoneless, right? We're like, why are we talking about zone stuff? But I think the, the signal-based components is where it starts to get really interesting because, uh, and this uh, little disclaimer here, this is all based on the RFC. These are final RFCs, but this is where it seems to be going, right? And, but this is not usable today. They couldn't use this signals true uh, annotation today, but it, uh, it appears that that's what will happen shortly. And so these signal-based components, hence why I called the all previous ones zone-based, right? Now these are zoneless signal-based components. So what's happening with uh, signal components and why they're so cool is that change detection within a signal component is only scheduled when that signal is, is read from the template, right? And we don't need zone anymore to tell us when something occurred by patching all these browser APIs and running a bunch of times. Angular will now know, hey, that uh, signal value is changed. The template is reading that value. We're going to run change detection on this view or this component, right? And so this is enabling us to have uh, local or per view change detection. Uh, at least this is what was discussed in the RFC as a, as a, as a decision, right? It's, providing fine-grained information on the model changes. Zone.js doesn't tell us where or what happened or which component has updated or where you have to go look. But this, these signal components, right, if you have a tree of signal components, it will know, hey, this is the component that has updates, this is what you have to change, and these are all dependencies to go all, update also. And another awesome thing, right, kudos to the Angular team for always making things seamless for us, all these new features. Like, it's going to coexist seamlessly with zone components as they exist now. So you could still use zone.js, you could still have on-push components, but you could also, uh, in the future, have these signal components that are kind of removed from the, 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 the trees that we've looked at so far. So let's look at an example of signal-based components. Uh, this time, right, we have the button down in, these chi in this child node, and when we click the button, what's going to happen is a new signal value is going to be set, or whatever happens, right, the template's reading a new signal value, Angular knows about this, and it's saying, hey, we no longer have to start at the top anymore. I just know that this view or this component has to be updated. Right, so again, we looked at like where we were checking the whole tree, and then we were looking at just the path that we have to follow for the on-push components, and now only the view or the component where the signal is read. So great efficiency. Um, it's an optimized change detection strategy. No more top-down checking. Oops, I thought that was up there. Optimized change detection. It's balanced in its granularity, right? The RFC mentioned that it's going to potentially be component or view-based, right? We might not have a huge uh, map of every single signal value read, and it's going to be a lot to handle, right? It's going to be the perfect balance, but yet much more efficient. Um, and it's just a really cool way to compose Angular apps. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much, everybody. Go build cool stuff. Uh, that's me, Anthony Scardapane. Yeah. <laughs>